Good evening. On behalf of the Davidson College Chaplain's Office, welcome to the annual Staley Distinguished Christian Lecture. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those who are joining us online this evening. After tonight's lecture, students are invited to gather in the oasis immediately following the lecture for a short Q&A with tonight's guest, Dr. Bryant. The oasis is located on the fourth floor uh, in the chaplain's office uh, next to the elevators. So please take advantage of that opportunity. The Staley Distinguished Christian Lecture Series was established at Davidson College in 1970 by Thomas F. Staley, class of 1924. And Mr. Staley wanted to give students and others in the college community an opportunity to hear distinguished Christian speakers reflect on their personal faith in some aspect of their expertise in ways that are intellectually engaging and spiritually nourishing. Each year, the chaplain's office is honored to welcome a guest or a neighbor from around the world or country to share something of how their faith informs their field of interest, expertise, or service. Now to introduce this year's speaker, Ms. Raven Holmes, class of 2025. Let's welcome her. Dr. Seema Bryant completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Duke University and her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical Center's Victims of Violence program. Upon graduating, she became the coordinator of the Princeton University Share Program, program which provides intervention and prevention programming to combat sexual assault, sexual harassment, and harassment based on sexual orientation. She is currently a tenured professor of psychology in the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University, where she directs the Culture and Trauma Research Laboratory. Her clinical and research interests center on interpersonal trauma and the societal trauma of oppression. She is a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women and a past APA representative to the United Nations. Dr. Tima also served on the APA Committee on International Relations and Psychology and the Committee on Women in Psychology. Dr. Tima served as the 2023 president of the American Psychology Association, the leading scientific and professional organization representing psychology with more than 120,000 members. Her vision for APA expanded psychology far beyond the academy to empower marginalized communities to heal, to reach people who haven't had access to therapy, and to mobilize the field to use its full power to address widespread trauma, grief, and oppression, including the trauma of racism. Her APA presidential accomplishments include hosting a public-facing summit on practical, culturally informed responses to trauma, grief, and oppression, creating an online culturally informed trauma kit for diverse communities, disseminating knowledge on decolonial and liberation psychology, and developing a documentary that highlights the important work of psychologists of historically excluded identity so others can break through glass ceilings. Dr. Tima Bryant is an ordained minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, is a gifted orator and internationally recognized expert in trauma recovery. Dr. Bryant offers wonderful content on social media as Dr. Bryant and is the host of the Homecoming podcast about mental health. Help me extend a warm Davidson welcome to our 2024 daily distinguished Christian lecture speaker, Dr. Tima Bryant. Hence, that I am meant to live an abundant life and an abundant life is not one where I am running from the shadows. An abundant life is where I am fully occupying my space, my gifts, my voice, my agency, and I am aware that I am not walking alone that the holy of holies <laughs> is accompanying me. Even when you show up to a campus and you don't see a lot of your own reflection, you can still know that the heavenly host is walking with you and that no one did you a favor, but that you belong here. Turn to tell somebody you belong here. You belong here. You belong here. And so as we think about surviving and thriving 
it is important that I raise this Christian model of trauma recovery because often these disciplines are unnaturally separated where people will say, are you uh, a psychological scientist or are you a woman of faith that you have to choose? I was very concerned. My son goes to a Christian elementary school and the science teacher sent home a study guide for their weekly test. And on the guide was the question, who should you trust? A, God, B, science. I gotta get my tuition back. <laughs> We're in the wrong place. <laughs> so it becomes this false, unnecessary choice as if the creator of the universe is not the creator of the universe. And so the very things that we study are the patterns that God put into place. And so for us to release the myth that you have to either pray or go to therapy, we can pray on the way to therapy. <laughs> With some therapists, you could pray in therapy. You could pray on the way home from therapy. And some people in religious spaces brag about the fact that they haven't had any sessions. And what I would like to say is we can tell. <laughs> you're just walking around. You're just, you're just out here walking around, no sessions. Amen, amen, amen. And so what a gift to liberate people from the false choice. It is a painful thing when we have convinced people that if they love God, they should never need help. What a painful thing. We don't say you're a person of faith, don't call a plumber. You're a person of faith, don't go to the dentist, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, go to the dentist. And so we are deserving of all of the good things. And sometimes God works through people for our healing, our wholeness, and our wellness. And it's a good thing. So I want to start with my positionality. A part of this lecture is about not only my research, but like, what's my story? Yes. And so I want to say as a woman of African descent, uh, a part of my story is being a survivor of intergenerational trauma. And whoever your uh, uh, four parents are, they went through some things that affected you. Whatever your race or ethnicity is, I want you to know your stuff did not begin on the day you were born. It predates you. So your parents and your grandparents went through some experiences and there was something called the transmission of trauma. So some of our wounds are inherited. How do they get passed down? Some of them get passed down neurologically. A lot of research in this area has been done with uh, descendants of Holocaust survivors, where there's a transformation in the brain that can be documented, yes? So it can uh, affect our uh, neurology, it can affect our biology, it can affect our nervous systems, and we can pass that down. Not only that, it gets passed down through observation. How did you see your family members act differently in certain spaces? How did their body language change? How did their tone change? How did their perception of themselves uh, become evident in certain spaces? And, and, and did you take that message in as a mandate as it relates to you? Not only do you have what you observed, but then some of us were told things directly, like you better be twice as good, like you'll be the last one hired and the first one fired that you don't just represent you, you represent all of us. So some of us came with some messaging about how we had to be. Within African-American tradition, there's a poem from the Harlem Renaissance, we wear the mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our teeth and shades our eyes. And so we learn masking psychologically. So when you ask us how we are, we say blessed, because it ain't none of your business if I'm not. How are you? I'm fine. I'm wonderful. I'm highly favored. And so we have learned scripting and the scripts were necessary for survival. 
And not only do we have then the biology, we have what we observe, we have what we were taught, and then we also have other people's expectations and lack of expectations of us. Raise your hand if related to any aspect of your identity you have ever been underestimated. Yeah, yeah. Turn and tell your neighbor, you too? You too? <laughs> now that can get tiring. The gift of that is they don't see you coming, right? They're like, how does she end up at the head of the table? Surprise, surprise. So uh, there is the reality of intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, our uh, American Indian, Native American siblings call it ancestral wounds. And they also call it collective grief. So I invite you to reflect on what did you carry that predates you? And how did you get that? So not only am I a survivor of racism, of sexism, of intergenerational trauma, I also am, I grew up primarily in Baltimore, Maryland, which while there are wonderful things about the city, there also are high rates of community violence. And so I saw that a lot growing up and I didn't realize how pervasive it was until now I'm raising my two children in Los Angeles and I picked my daughter just started her first year of college. But when I came to pick her up one day from eighth grade, she got in the car and she just was looking stunned. And I said, what happened? She was in the eighth grade and just saw her first fight. That was unfathomable to me. Like, I can't tell you the first fight I saw. I, I saw fighting in kindergarten. Like, that's just, that's just, that was just what it was, right? And so some of your traumas you don't even think of as a big deal because it was so common, yes? So there was community violence, there was school violence. Uh, and then my father who was a pastor got elected to be a bishop uh, of the AME church in West Africa, which was an incredible experience. I later found out that my essay on that experience is what got me into Duke University. And it really blessed my self-esteem because everybody in a position of authority looked like me. So I didn't have any question of like, could I do something? Cause I had already seen it, right? The head of the bank, the principal, the head of every business, the president, everybody was a reflection. So it gives you a sense of, it's not like a nonsensical fantasy. It's like, I really could do anything, right? And so the whole first year was amazing. It was also amazing for my own self-esteem because I grew up uh, kind of feeling like I was smart. I had good grades, feeling like I was talented. I did dance and poetry. Uh, but growing up in the Baltimore public school system in inner city Baltimore, uh, I did not feel beautiful. So there's a word some of you may have heard of, colorism. So colorism, at first I just thought it was in the black community, but I understand it's in the Latinx community and the Asian community where uh, the closer you are uh, phenotypically and color-wise and hair and eyes to white, the more you would be considered beautiful. Okay, so take a look. <laughs> right? So it was amazing for me. And talking about internalized racism, these are Black children teasing other Black children, right? We're like, the worst thing you could say to a kid was, you're so Black, right? And so then we moved, I am a teenager, we moved to Liberia, West Africa, I have you all, I have the same face. Nothing happened on the plane. Same face, I get off the plane and people are like, I want to marry you. <laughs> like, like, who me? Who me? So, <laughs> it was like the world had turned upside down. Like literally, I became Miss High School Liberia. Like, that would not happen in Baltimore, right? With this same face, yes? So it was transformative for me uh, that whole first year and a half, the second half of our second year, a civil war broke out. So I'm telling you how I ended up focusing on trauma. Yes, it's not by accident. So we came there as a family of four with 13 suitcases and we left with one bag, with one day's notice, right? That the U.S. Embassy was like, if you all get on the plane, we can assure your safety. After that flight tomorrow, we're not coming back for anybody. So... Now we have this issue of privilege because I had friends 
who couldn't get on the plane. Yeah, I didn't do anything to earn my spot on the plane. Right? There's nothing better about me where my life should be protected and somebody else's should not. So now we have to come to what do you do with privilege? Instead of trying to deny it, right, or getting stuck in guilt about it, privilege gives responsibility, right? So now when I come back and I'm talking to people who don't even know where Liberia is on the map, right, then I become a witness right? I become a truth teller. And then I also end up dedicating my life to the prevention and intervention of trauma. Yes, not by accident. Now then we have war, we have community violence. And I really wish that was the end of my trauma story. I really, they, some people are like, that's enough. Somebody say that's enough. That's, that should be, that should have been enough. That should have been enough. So one summer I go home to Baltimore um, from my studies at Duke University and uh, a member of our church uh, who I had seen, you know, over the years, just in and out of the church, in and out of my home, a uh, member of the church stopped by on a weekday. And so I opened the door and that member of our church assaulted me. Yeah. And then I didn't say anything not to my family, not to uh, police. I went back to Duke University and for the first time in my life, I struggled academically. Like I had never gotten a bad grade. And suddenly I could not, like I would read the textbook and I didn't know what am I supposed to remember? Like, and, 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 if, and I couldn't remember it. And so I was trying to figure out who to, go to, and I went to uh, a black administrator on campus and I told her what happened because all of my grades were like plummeting and I was plummeting. And you know, you gotta love culture and you gotta love your aunties, right? So I picked this black administrator to go tell my, my truth to. And when I tell her, she's shaken and uh, she says, I'll be right back. And she steps out and she's gone a long time. Trying to tell your neighbor a long time. <laughs> I'm like, did she forget about me? What? Like, what happened? What had happened? She came back into her own office where she left me with a box of food. I wasn't hungry, <laughs> but I ate it because I knew what she was trying to give me. Yes, she didn't have the words. So it was just eat this. <laughs> I sat there and I ate it. I sat there and I ate it. And she felt like she had given me something and she had. And, uh, and uh, then she advised I go to the counseling center, which I did. And uh, I ended up as after I worked through mine, Duke University had a program where the, you could work in the community and the university would pay you. And so my first job was at the Rape Crisis Center of Durham. And so I was working it through, I was working it through, and I was working it through, and I was working it through, and I was working it through. And, it through. and so I do not come to this work of how do we heal trauma simply because I find it intellectually interesting. Right. It's not just like something I'm curious about, but I understand the impact of wounds. And I also am so glad firsthand that I understand the real possibility of healing and wholeness and wellness. And that is why I continue to tell the story, because people are used to only hearing the story when people are in a broken state. They're not used to the story. And this is the person who's the president of the American Psychological Association. Yes. They're not used to the story. And this is the same person who like, likes to dan dance and likes poetry and has like real, real joy. And it's important for me to tell the story for people to get a glimpse when they are in the valley of the shadow of death, what is possible for me. And what often happens is we stop telling the story and, and then people believe your life must have been easy. And I love when people say that to me. They're like, oh, you are a pastor's daughter. Your life must have been so easy. 
I'm like, I'm glad you think so. I'm glad you, cause you know, what is the alternative is people meet you and they say, mm, I can tell you've been through something. <laughs> And I don't want that. I don't want that. I want you to think it was easy. <laughs> and so we take a moment to reflect on your journey. You survived some things to get here. And I like to say there's no hierarchy on trauma. Because sometimes we'll start comparing. And people say, like, oh, I wasn't evacuated from a war or this didn't happen. The experiences that broke your heart. The experiences that took your breath away the experiences that made you question some things, the experiences that made it hard for you to study or even wonder why am I studying? And yet you persisted and you're here. Turn and tell somebody I'm glad you're here. And so there is a calling as we think about healing. The same God that raised Jesus is the same God that can raise us up. And I, for one, when people say like, what's your favorite part? My favorite part is resurrection. I know people like love the cross and maybe, maybe it's because I'm a trauma survivor. That's not my favorite thing. I like the empty tomb. <laughs> I like that part, okay? You know, uh, some, some Easter sermons are like really gruesome. Like people really get into it. And then the and the thought, I'm like, I got, like I've seen dead bodies. I, I, don't, I don't need all of that. Look, get me to the resurrection. <laughs> and so we are reminded that our faith is one of hope, of possibility, and of healing. And the spirit of the most high God says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I love you more than you love yourself. I know you more than you know yourself. You can run, but you can't hide. I am your very breath. I am your very breath. So come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. The Most High God says, I don't want to just use you. We like those songs. God, use me up, use me up. God said, you are not just a vehicle or a tool or instrument for other people's benefit. God said, I want you to feel the same goodness you're trying to give to everybody else. I want you to receive it for yourself. And we like to always couch it as like, get better, then you can help others. Get better because you're worthy. Because you're worth it. Because you're deserving of it. Full stop. But you know, we can talk about your ministry later. But you, right? You're worthy. And so for us to receive that. So the spirit of the Lord comes for us to have good news. That even though there are trying times and difficult times, that there is still the possibility for freedom. And trauma and stress and oppression keep us bound in different ways. And we want to be free. And so that's why I love when Jesus would ask the question, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? Because guess what? When you're made whole, this is the unpopular part they don't tell you. When you become whole, some people won't like it. Some people like you insecure. They like that you do whatever they say. They like you don't have a lot of opinions. They like that you say, what do you think? What do you think? You get some thoughts of your own. And it will be a good discernment for you to see who celebrates your freedom and who's mad. <laughs> who's mad that you have some ideas of your own? Turn and tell somebody, get free. Get free. And so we think about getting free. I invite you to inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. And as you continue to breathe, when you make your exhale longer than it, your inhale, it teaches your nervous system that we're okay, that I'm okay, right? It regulates your nervous system because when you are stressed, what do you do? Hold your breath or, or very shallow, quick breath, right? But when I, it's a signal to my body all is well, all is well. So when people are trying to stress you out, <laughs> they gonna wonder what you're doing. <laughs> hey, yes. When we get caught sometimes in the past 
And we need to get grounded in the present. We can use our senses. So I invite you to look around the room and think to yourself three things that you see. And then notice if there's anything you smell, hopefully somebody's perfume or some food. If it's anything else, don't mention it. Notice if you taste anything, maybe your leftover dinner or some gum. Notice what you feel, your glasses on your face, the seat under your legs, the floor under your feet. That gets you into the present, yes? And then we can think about our self-compassion holds to also help to ground us. And all of this, I wanna say from a trauma-informed perspective is optional. So I'm gonna make offerings. You can do them if you like. If you wanted to stare at me, you could do that. It's your choice, it's your body. Somebody say amen, amen. So one compassion hold is one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. Inhale again through the nose. Exhaling out through the mouth. And then the hand that's on your belly, lift to your forehead. Inhale in through the nose. Exhale out through the mouth. The hand that's on your heart goes behind your head, so you're cradling your head. Inhale in through the nose. Exhale out through the mouth. The last one is to hug yourself. Inhaling in through the nose. Exhaling out through the mouth. And there's a big word, interoceptivity, which simply means body awareness. So you're the expert on your own body with your bodily awareness, go back to the one that felt the best to you. It was here, 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 or hug. There's no right answer. Whatever felt right to you, go back to it. Now I think I'm here. <laughs> and take a breath. And release. Excellent. So we begin by our healing by getting present to what is. To come home to myself is to tell myself the truth instead of public relations. So I don't have to keep saying I'm fine. I could actually say I'm tired or I'm upset or I'm irritated or I'm confused. Whatever it is we're feeling and you can feel more than one thing at the same time. So part of our spiritual and religious life can help us in our healing by having a community. Therapy is usually 50 minutes a week. If you're in crisis, it might be twice a week. If you have a church family, they might be available multiple times a week. They might hang out all night in a prayer vigil. <laughs> they could have Bible study and choir rehearsal. You could have all kinds of things. Somebody say community. Now, now that's assuming that this is an affirming community, right? Hopefully it's not people who are like trying to break your spirit. So social support can be a part of the benefits. Another one can be our worldview, our framing um, of this too shall pass, of weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So there can be teachings that help us when we are going through hard times. We also have a lot of research studies on the benefits of if you have maternal or paternal engagement in the church, uh, some of the positive behaviors that are encouraged in young people because of like what the norms or the expectations are. There's a lot of great research on the benefits of prayer. The research studies I find the most interesting are the benefits that have been found when people didn't know others were praying for them. That, that, come on, come on, that, that's not placebo, okay? It's like you didn't even know you were on the prayer list and look at this recovery. So uh, Duke University has done a, a lot, the medical school has done a lot of research around uh, religious coping and prayer and a recovery from surgery and these types of things. Um, and it's also interesting to see what isn't in the literature. And what I noticed is it's easier for us to measure things that we can uh, quantify and norm. So they'll say, how many times do you go to service? How many times do you pray? How many times did you reach out to your pastor for counseling? Um, I have not seen a measure on encounters with the Holy Spirit. They don't say how many times did you run a lap? Did you lay before the altar? How long did you, how long were you down there? <laughs> uh, tell us about your latest dream. 
you know, it was funny when suddenly I thought I had all these clients who were dreamers. And then I realized it wasn't suddenly I had just finally started asking. Right. People will tell you what you ask about. If you don't ask, they think this isn't the place for that. So we consider these different experiences. They are all different forms of trauma. They may have been childhood, adulthood, natural disasters, oppression, medical trauma. And again, we wanna be careful not to create hierarchy, right? Because pain is pain and it does not help anybody for us to compete or compare. So trauma is an experience that overwhelms your usual capacity to cope. All of us face everyday stressors, and then there are traumatic stressors. Those are things that kind of take the wind out of you. They disrupt your sense of who you are. They can make it hard for you to regulate your emotions. Uh, I, it was interesting. I was working with a client, and they kept uh, basically getting into fights. And so I was trying to help them to see, like, not everything is drama worthy. So they were describing some incident, and I said, on a scale one to 10, how disrespectful was that of you? And that's when I realized they counted everything as like an eight. Like everything is an eight. So then they come out guns blazing on everything. So then it became like a lesson in what's the difference between a two and an eight? Like we cannot respond the same thing, same way to every stimulus, right? That they are not all the same. And when we do that, we can sabotage ourselves and also it can result in people not taking it seriously, okay? So I'll give you this example. My, my mother growing up was a screamer, okay? So because she screamed so much, it ended up meaning nothing. Because right? she gonna scream again tomorrow, right? Now, my dad is very like selective, like it takes a lot to make him upset. So now that he's yelling, you know, like you have really, <laughs> you have really messed up. You have really messed up. So we have to ask ourselves, how do I have a measured response? Or am I overreacting or creating crises because I do not, I, I never had it modeled for me that not everything is drama worthy. Amen? Amen. So the trauma also can be that you're the direct target. It could also be what you witnessed. I had a lot of people in, in my study who more than the trauma they experienced, what they felt distressed about was watching their mother be abused and feeling helpless to protect her. And they rated that higher than the thing that had actually happened to them, right? And then we can have vicarious trauma. We know now with these phones, you don't even have to be there I mean, we see the devastation, right? We see it for the Middle East, right? We see it in Congo. We see it uh, in Durham. We, we see it. Visually, you see it. And so the impact of that on our nervous system uh, can be very disruptive. So I invite you to think about the different ways that the trauma affects you. And I invite you to take an inhale in through your nose. Exhale out through your mouth. Sometimes we are judgmental because people respond differently than we do. Some people respond to trauma with depression. Some people respond with anger. Some experience numbness. Some people are disconnected. Some people act out in particular ways and you feel like I'm not even being myself right now. You can have difficulty concentrating and focusing as I described when I came back to school. It can impair your relationships. It can affect us even spiritually and somatically means in the body. That's people who say, it didn't bother me, I just have migraines. It didn't bother me, I just have backache because your body is telling the story, right? The body is telling the story. So we know that healing is not only possible, but it is necessary. And you want to think about how did trauma affect your faith? Some people grew stronger in their faith. Some people lost their faith. Some people modified their faith because this is what happens. You were told some things about God and then life happened. So then you had to grapple with like, what's, which of these is not true, right? I had a young lady who had been uh, molested as a child and she came to therapy and said, I'm trying to figure out which of these things is not true. Either God is not love or God is not everywhere or God is not all powerful. Right. She's like, one of them can't be true, because if not, right, like then God was just sitting there. 
right? So unfortunately, many of us are in religious spaces where people aren't allowed to ask questions or we give them these like um, cookie cutter answers, right? And some of these cookie cutter answers are very harmful, right? It says things like God was testing your faith. That to an eight-year-old, right? That like that was the that was the test. That was the point of that, you know. Or someone is grief-stricken because their mother died, and people say God needed another voice in His heavenly choir. Like, why my mother have to be the alto, <laughs> right? So we leave no room for the mystery. I think some people will respect us more, right, and respect faith more if we say, "I don't have all the answers." And I know this is very painful, and yet I still believe that God is present and loves you so much, right? It just feels more honest, because it is more honest, right? It is more honest. So people have to grapple with who is God. They grapple with their ideas about humanity. Some people were like, I didn't know people could be so cruel or could do that kind of thing. Um, and then questions about the religious community, like what is church and who is church? Um, but imperfect people who are trying to work toward the fullness of who God called them to be. Uh, but we don't always get it right. Yes. So we want to consider the fact that there can be some barriers that while our faith can help our healing, there can also be some barriers to our healing. And so people who are stuck uh, in places, actually, I'm going to go into my model for the sake of time. It's going to this is going to be integrated. Don't you worry. Uh, before I go to my motto, I want to say some of my research on religious coping and sexual assault. Survivors in their subjective answers would say that their faith helped them heal from sexual trauma. But quantitatively, it was the reverse where. The higher level of religious coping, the higher their PTSD and depression. So I had two possible uh, considerations for that. So one may be when you're more distressed, you pray more, right? When people are feeling great, some people don't even pray. They like they pray during hard times. <laughs> so it may be the more stressed out you are, the more prayerful you are. And that's why like those two things are going together. Uh, the other possibility, and I'm sure there could be more, is some people are a part of faith communities that promote very victim blaming messages. So if they're very engaged in those spaces, then they may feel even worse about themselves, right? Depending on what's being said from the pulpit. So we wanna think about, uh, is the faith that I represent or is the faith that I try to embody a help or hindrance to people who are trying to heal, right? Because we can play a role in that. So to be a trauma-informed campus and a trauma-informed church, we want to create a space where people can actually be made whole. I want to give you a song I learned in Botswana. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no, never. You ready to try it? Yes, you are. You are. You are. Turn and tell, turn and tell your neighbor. I can't wait to hear you sing. I can't wait. I can't wait. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No. No, never. Now we're going to try it in sign. So get your hands ready. Because ain't no party like a Dr. T party. All right. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no. Never and a hand in sign, and then just tell your neighbor you sound good. <laughs> ah, all right. So I want to give you 
a trauma recovery model uh, that I developed. Don't worry about these slides. I always over-prepare. Don't worry. Okay. So can we all agree the crucifixion was a trauma? Okay. Nobody, I hope nobody's like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. Okay. We all agree. We all agree that was traumatic. So there is nothing new under the sun. And so the model for healing that we now find evidence for in our science is also supported in the narrative of Jesus after the crucifixion. So let's take a look. The first part of the model is called tune time. Somebody say tune time. Now, Jesus is the son of God. God can do anything. So at any moment, God could raise Jesus from the dead, right? At any moment, God could do it instantly, yes? Now, I know in the black church, we like to preach it with some drama. So we're like, oh, Jesus and the devil was wrestling all night Friday and all night Saturday, but all night Sunday morning. Okay, so it's good. I like it. I like it. Okay. And yet, God could have got him up Friday night, right? God could, if God wanted to. Like, I just don't believe it was like a tight match. Like, it was like, you know, the angels are like, who's going to win? You know? So then you have to ask yourself, what was the purpose? And I really believe that God wanted to show us the necessity of tune time. That many of us are not comfortable being still. We feel we always have to prove something. And we think that God requires us to always prove something. So it'll be like someone close to you just died, but you got to go and serve on tomorrow morning because that's the Christian thing to do. Mm, why don't you go lay down somewhere? Have you ever encountered someone who was really in such a raw place they should have stayed home? Right? And maybe we've been that person where you're bleeding all over people because you didn't give yourself tomb time. And so I believe a part of our healing is in stillness. Can I tell you, you know, some people get real mixed up in their theology. <laughs> a close connection with tune time or stillness can be meditation. And do you know that there are some people who say meditation is anti-Christ? Wait a minute. So running around the church is Christ. Sitting still and breathing is anti-Christ. <laughs> Like, what in the world? Be still and know that I am God. Like, I don't know how people will make up stuff, okay? So let's not do that. Christians can sit still and breathe and just relax, <laughs> you know, and just do that, do that. Uh, so, and it also shows, you know, us not knowing church history, the desert mothers and the desert fathers, right? They go out in the desert and be still with God. And the longer they stay there, the more powerful they became in the spirit. But we act like the only way to show our faith is through works, right? Even in the black church, we have the song, I keep so busy serving my Jesus. I ain't got time to die. What? What? I mean, that sounds like slavery, right? I ain't got time to die. That's how busy I am serving. No, no, no. Sweet hour of prayer. Let me let me be on that. Let me be on that. Let me be on steal away. Steal away to Jesus. Let me be on that. So a part of your healing will come in your stillness. Because you also have to ask yourself, what am I running from? What am I running from? And if I could face myself, if I could face the past, maybe I would start healing. Yeah. Because when we don't take the time to heal, we run into the same thing with a different face and a different name, right? You go into a new job or you switch universities or colleges. And it's the same thing because wherever you go, there you are. And there go other human beings. So now here you are again, right? You went from Larry to Michael and it's the same man, right? You went from Debbie to Susie, same issue, right? Because we didn't go within, yes? So tomb time, number one. The second one is Jesus went to talk appeared first to the women. The women at that time don't have status. The women cannot testify in court, but the women were the people who showed up when Jesus was on the cross. So the disciples went running and hiding. and they were scared, it's okay. It's okay to be scared. And the women were there at the foot of the cross. 
And so when Jesus is rising, who does he first appears to? He appears to the people who were able to show up when he was in pain. So you want to be selective about who you turn to when you're bleeding. Some people just don't have good bedside manner. Some people, they want to celebrate you when you graduate, but they're not going to be on the phone with you when you got a D. They just, that's not them, okay? <laughs> so you want to pay attention to who shows up for me when I'm in pain? Who, here it is, who do I not have to perform in front of? Right? Some people, you just feel like you got to act like everything's okay. And then some people, they just look at you and you start crying. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Right? Or oh, they look, that one good hug. They pull you in on that hug and you're like, <laughs> right? So some people, if you just hear their voice on the phone, right? And they can tell on the phone just by your breathing something is wrong. <laughs> right? So pick your support wisely. Don't pick people based on popularity, right? Don't pick people based on status. Pick people who can walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Those are the kind of friends that I need, yes? And then self-care. There's a verse after Jesus rises from the dead when he gets in the presence of the disciples and the verse just says one thing. Jesus asked them, do y'all have something to eat? And they gave him some fish and he ate it. Woo. Ooh, a whole verse. You got something to eat? Sure do. <laughs> I got some catfish, got some salmon, got some lake trout. So if the holy one, if the righteous one, if the one who can terrify the devil had to stop and eat, how about you? How about you? We act like we're so busy. When I first started seeing clients, I kept my own calendar and I kept scheduling clients during my lunch break. It was just, I would, I would get a call and someone needed to be seen and this is how I would frame it in my head. What's more important, their healing or a sandwich? Right, I would frame it like that and then I would schedule them and then what was my wake up call, I was seeing a client and I was giving her this heartfelt speech about self care, she was a trauma survivor and talking about self care and it's so important and you're worthy and you're worthy. In the middle of my speech, my stomach started growling. <laughs> So as I was saying, it is so important to take care of myself. So I had to have a meeting with myself. Do I want to just say it or do I want to live it? Right? And I want you to live it, to believe that you are worthy of care. You're worthy of going to sleep. You're worthy of eat. That when you eat food, if you could eat it saying, I'm eating this because I want to live. I know right now when you're young, you can have all those cinnamon rolls and everything else, but it's going to come a time <laughs> where the body is telling you something else. So you might as well start now. I'm drinking water because I love myself. Yes? For us to take care of these temples. Then I have to say something controversial and I fly out tomorrow morning. So if you're mad, I'll be gone. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the role of the guests. The guests can say something and walk away. So it's very important for us to distinguish forgiveness from reconciliation. And sometimes, especially in the church, we pressure people to forgive people who are not sorry. And then we pressure them to reconcile. So that's just not even biblical, right? Jesus, and you could text this, the, the, check the text, all my biblical scholars in the room, Jesus says on the cross, you know, they're for God, forgive them, right? Immediately, everyone's like, it's instant. He said, God, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, check this. After he rose, not once did Jesus go hang out with the people who were trying to kill him. Check. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find it. Go look. Go look. Go flip through the pages. Never. So too many times the reason we're not healed is we're trying to hang out with people who want to destroy us. Right. As my mother would say, I'm not mad. I'm just finished. Right. I'm not like some people can't come into your house. Like say, it's not safe. Some people are not safe. Right. And we have done a bad job with this messaging where there's no accountability for harm doers. And it's for victims to keep just forgiving, forgiving and forgiving. And that's how people get hurt. 
That's how people get hurt. I was teaching a women's Bible study in LA and a lady came up to me before the women's Bible study and told me she had forgiven her dad. Her dad had molested her and she dropped her kids there before she came to Bible study. I said, you can't stay, ma'am. I'm going to give you the handout and you have to go get your kids. You had, no, we're not doing that. You can forgive your father all you want, but no, 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 no. You, you, we have to teach a better way, right? Reconciliation requires repentance, a change of attitude and a change of behavior. Forgiveness, I could forgive you all day, all night, but in order for there to be reconciliation, we need transformation. Somebody say amen. If you don't like it, say, I'm glad she's leaving. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Look, don't, don't bother me. Okay. We're almost done. Then the next step is show your wounds. Jesus did not hide his wounds. When he was confronted with doubt, he's like, here it is right here. And that's the part of psychotherapy where we are doing exposure therapy. Can I face my past? Can I even speak of my past? Because as long as I'm running from it, it is overpowering me. And so with each time I say it, it shatters the shame, right? So I have gotten to the point, I mean, it's been many years since I was an undergrad, but it's gotten to the point when I tell my story, I don't become undone because it's a part of my story, but it's not the fullness of who I am, yes? So you want to get to the place of, if you are still hiding it, ask yourself why? Right? And it doesn't mean that you have to tell everybody, quote unquote, all of your business. But if you can tell no one, like there may be a story that you have told yourself about shame that still has you bound. And there is freedom. Have you ever like told a best friend or a spouse or somebody like something that was very embarrassing to you and like the world didn't end and like they were still your friend and like we breathed and they were like, oh, like. Okay, I never said that out loud, you know? So it's healing to not only face my wounds, but to show my wounds and that I'm still here. Amen? Amen. Then ascension. This is in psychology called post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth. So that's how I don't just want to survive. How did I grow in the aftermath of that? Like, what did I learn about myself? What did I learn about my faith? What did I learn about relationships? So I pull the wisdom out of the wounds. So many of us settle for uh, resurrection, but we could have ascension, right? Jesus conquered death and then was like, I'm going even higher than this. Turn to tell somebody, you might as well go higher. You might as well. You might as well. And then the final one, it's then Jesus says, I'm coming back for you all. Now this, all those other steps are what a lot of church people skip. We go from trauma to wanting to be in charge of everybody else's healing, right? It's like people who want to become therapists and have never had one session. You just go and skip all of that. You skipping the wounds, you skipping the fish, you skip the forgiveness. Just now, everybody listen to me. <laughs> and it's like, have, have you been made whole? How are you going to lead people where you haven't gone? Yes. And so with all of the beautiful things you want to do with your life, let's first do your process. Do your process. Do your. That's why psychology gets a bad rap. You got a bad reputation. People are like, mm, psychologists, I don't know. That's because some people have been skipping their process and out here promoting themselves. And it's like, no, you don't represent us. <laughs> So you do your work and then you reach back. So as we begin to come to a close, I want to say that if you are trying to help others, and all of us should in various ways, try to be of service, that it's a revolutionary act to say, I am going to have a lifestyle that honors Sabbath. Some of us wait until we're burned out and then your body demands that you can't get up anymore. How about not waiting for God to make you lie down, right? How about if we, we're going to program it, right? We're going to schedule it into our very lives that I want to live well and I want to do well and I want to take Sabbath. Turn and tell somebody you should relax more.
And some of them, they think you just said it because I said it. So go back and say, for real, for real. <laughs> say, look, I'm not just saying that. I'm not just saying that. And so it is my desire that you would give yourself permission to get some sessions. You got your counseling center here. I heard, look, I, I think I heard there's some vacancies. <laughs> okay. Get your, while you're here, while you're getting your education, because for many people, it's their first time going and it allows you to look back on your past with some distance and some clarity. Because some things you think were the norm are just the way it was in your house, but it wasn't really healthy, right? So not only get some sessions, but I hope you were also in a place where you're being spiritually nourished. If we talk about different weights, if you grew up all your life in church and feel like you don't know how to pray, like then you're still like a featherweight. Do y'all see what's happening in the world? We need some heavyweights. We need some people who are like not going to back up who aren't going to be intimidated, who will pray about human trafficking, that will pray about war and conflict, that will pray about suicide, will pray, right, and act. There's an African proverb, you're going to love it. When you pray, move your feet. When you pray, move. so I'm going to pray and I'm going to work, and I'm going to pray and I'm going to serve, and I'm going to pray and I'm going to minister, and I'm going to pray and I'm going to treat myself right. So we started with this little light of mine. I want to end with silence no more. I was born to roar because we are sons and daughters of the Lion of Judah. Amen. All right. So for this one, and those are just some resources. I think some of you all already have homecoming. So it goes, silence no more. I was born to roar. Silence no more, I was born to roar. The first time it went up, the second time it went down. If that means nothing to you, let the notes come any way they want to come out of your mouth. Okay. Silence no more, I was born to roar. Silence no more, I was born to roar with our sign. Silence no more, I was born to roar. Silence no more, I was born to roar. With a ooh, in case you forget the words. Ooh, 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 ooh. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May heaven smile upon you and give you peace. May your heart be healed. May you do more than survive. May you thrive. Henceforth, now and forevermore. And the people of God declare, amen. Amen. amen.